You're on the road less traveled with Gary L. and Gigi's Boo over here at reallibertymedia.com, RLM Radio. Happy to be here. Happy to see everyone in the chat room at reallibertymedia.com. Hey, Gigi's Boo, what are you doing? I'm just sitting over here as fine as frog hair, just waiting on you to open the show. I'm going to say, hi, everybody. <laughs> we well, got got to wait for the clock, you know, the ringy dingy. It's seven, right. seven o'clock, it's June tenth, two thousand eighteen. My how time flies when you're having fun, a little fun even too, Gigi's boo. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So what about the chat room? They're kind of they're not real chatty tonight. They they kind of were. They're alive enough in a little bit. Yeah, you know they. It's, I think people get a little bit tarred. <laughs> they got to take yeah. a break. Got to take a breath sometimes, but that's okay. We got uh, quite a bunch of people, quite a few people actually hanging out, you know. And of course, Grim Near, he's the head guy in charge here at reallibertymedia.com. dot com. He's running the chat, sits in the chat. I don't know. He he's got so many irons in the fire all day, every day. I don't know how he does it. I don't know if does he ever sleep. That's the question. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I know I'm generally up in the very wee hours of the morning, and yeah, I don't know. I think maybe Grimner. Maybe maybe he's cloned himself. Maybe there's actually two or three Grimners running around. What do you think, GD's boo? That would be nice. <laughs> yeah. That would that would mean my mother would have several sons. And I'd have two or three brothers. That's right. You got that right. <laughs> and then, of course, Kate's here. Kate's Kate's pretty much here most of the time. We're happy that she shows up. And then other po- other folks listed. We have Asmo and Beth and Chalstony and Chloe and Free and Slave and Graham Z, who has her shows on here as well. I be Don C, Java Doctor. JJ is listed. Wanna Taco, Rain. Rob Works, I know he's active in the chat room right now, so hello to, hello to Rob Works. Trust No One, alias Behind the Woodshed, who just had his show from from noon noon o'clock to th- 2 p.m. Pacific time, but 3 p.m. on the East Coast or the right coast, or whatever you want to call it. He just finished up his show. Colfax, Dakota, Dima, Flash, Nasty. Frumpy, and there's Gigi's booze in the chat. Yeah, Grimmer says sleep. What's that? <laughs> we'll put a patent on that thing. Make make a lot of money. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, Kozu, Moy, Pox, Box, Poxified, Poxophone, Pawn Sauce, Sock Puppet, Skittle. Hello, Skittle. Seems to be active in the chat. And the Phantom, who seems to always be hanging around. <laughs> Who knows? Only the Phantom knows. So what's going on, Gigi's boo? What's been going on with you? Nothing much. Just doing a little sewing. Fiddling around here as usual, what I usually do. Had to see the doctor before I checked up. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. That's about it. Yeah, I think so. I got some pretty interesting stuff coming up as a result of that doctor's visit, and some, you know, some stuff that people. It always comes in handy. You never know when things like we're going to talk about come in handy. Before we do that, though, let's let's jump into some some quick quick news. A quick news update. This is a little bit old. Many of you probably have already heard it, but Homeland Security is going to start compiling a database of journalists and bloggers. <laughs> wow, how surprising is that? And you don't think that hasn't been going on already? And this was reported in Bloomberg back in April. But they want to monitor hundreds of thousands of news sources around the world and compile a database of journalists, editors, foreign correspondents, and bloggers to identify top media influencers. How do you like that fancy word, media influencers? I don't see the words fact 
included anywhere? You know, people who compile and share facts. I don't see that, but they want to call it media influencers, which is akin to calling someone a propagandist. Okay, you have to understand the subtleties of the language here. And, by the way, they're seeking a contractor, a public-private partnership, a contractor that can help it monitor traditional news sources as well as social media and identify any and all coverage related to the agency or a particular event according to a request for information that was released April 3rd. So you can read this article yourself, but it's, you know, it's one of the big things I get out of this is using a contractor. Guess, guess what? The contractor is not subject to Freedom of Information Act, <laughs> where uh, Department of Homeland Security is, but the contractor isn't. So you can let your mind do the calculating on what's behind all that. Also, as we move along in the news, a bill in California that had intended to put 5G wireless transmitters outside of every home, with well, a chicken in every pot, was paused. California had pending legislation, SB 649, that would have streamlined placement of 5G small cell distributed antenna systems, otherwise known as DAS or DOS, on electric and light poles in front of businesses and residences. Had it passed, it would have eliminated local control and jurisdiction with regard to DAS placement throughout the state of California. It would have stripped local governments of their property rights and forced them to ignore safety, aesthetic, and health issues. Now, apparently, that did not pass for whatever reasons and so forth. It whole lot of, lists a whole lot of reasons why one should be concerned. It says, thankfully, SB 649 was voted out of committee by a unanimous vote. It will now go on to a full Senate vote and then on to assembly for committees. So it, it kind of contradicted itself in the same article. But as we spoke of last week, this whole concern about local control has already been addressed in some manner by the Second Appeals Court, Federal Appeals Court, Second District something we talked about last week, and it's something that is being reviewed, you might say, as we speak, moving along. Environmentally, though, there are some things that have not been taken into account when we talk about millimeter wave technologies, so to speak, and a new publication reports that children absorb two to five times higher doses of microwave radiation than do adults. Uh-oh. A big storm popping outside. We may have to, we may have to cut this short. I don't know. Let's, let's hold on and see. I'm not going to lose another, another computer system. Anyway, as we go here, Washington D.C. An innovative study published today in, in Environmental Research. Researchers stimulated, simulate rather microwave radiation from virtual reality with a video streaming cell phone in a cardboard box placed in front of the eyes. Specific areas of the eyes and critical parts of the brain absorb between two to five times more cell phone radiation than the youngest child model compared to the adult model. Very important because one of the quotes from this whole, the one of the big takeaways in a published review says that current cell phone compliance testing does not account for children's physiology. That's a very, very important phrase that will be figured into some processes that are pr presently underway. Now, another thing that doesn't immediately seem to be related, but could very well be, a judge said to the EPA that they are legally required to turn over documentary evidence in the case of a climate denial. That sounds a little bit weird, but in battle, EPA Director Scott Pruitt went on national TV to announce on behalf of the U.S. government that, quote, I would not agree that CO2 is a primary contributor to the global warming that we see. He goes on to say that there's a tremendous disagreement about the degree of the impact of human activity on the climate. But moving along, these people who took exception to that statement filed a FOIA request to understand what documents, what studies, what information that 
Pruitt based that conclusion on, and they refused to share the documents. So they sued, to sue to get the documents. Now, one could extend this logic to other regulatory agencies in the government if they were taking a position that a certain technology was safe and you requested through FOIA all the documentation that they were using on which to base that rulemaking and they refused, well, we have some precedence here in any case that the court will require the agency to provide that information. Just something to put in the back pocket for future reference. And in kind of a, (laughs) and you can't make this stuff up news, the Brain Preservation Foundation Brain Preservation Services, BPF, is a nonprofit research organization with a mission to promote scientific research and services development of whole brain preservation for long-term static storage. So they want to take your brain and store it away. (laughs) Now, Atticus would probably go for that, wouldn't he, Gigi? He would go for anything. (laughs) He said he'd want Atticus' brain stored away because you never know when... The world may be saved by something he stored in his head. (laughs) Sure. Anyway, that's a a real quick rundown of some of the news of note that seemed to jump out at us. Now, Jeannie's Boo's going to talk a little bit about a medical experience she's had and having, and a particular treatment. About a month and a half ago, I reached up on my right ear, in the crease of my ear, next to my scalp. And I scratched a little bit, something itched, and I had a flake of skin come off, just like uh, dry skin, maybe dead skin. I said, man, what in the world is that? I must not be washing my ears well enough. Well, then all of a sudden it got sore. And when I tell you it was sore, I'm telling you it's been, it was really severe. Gary and I talked it over, and we tried numerous things. We tried Nilsborn ointment. We tried antifungal cream. We tried Plano Vaseline. And my sister's a firm believer that Vicks Vapor Rub would cure anything, so we even tried that. Well, nothing helped. It only got worse. It might be less red maybe a day or two, and then all of a sudden it would just grow right back and be angry and weepy, and it was terrible looking. Of course, I'm a right-side sleeper, So that made things that much worse because I laid on that ear all the time. Well, I went to my doctor. I was going for my checkup, blood work and everything. and I just showed it to him. And he said, whoo, that's nasty looking. I said, who are you telling? It's been this way about two months. He said, well, we're going to try something new that's really taking the storm. And I said, what is it? And he said, we're going to use... Honeycomb, 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 like that. I said, just regular honeycomb? He said, no, really, it comes in many forms, so we're going to do honey paste. So when he faxed the prescription in, believe it or not, the, the drugstore didn't even have it. They had a special order. It comes with just a tube. It has a little applicator you can put on it just to touch places. Or you can put it on a bandage or whatever if you want to cure up anything. They say it really works wonders in diabetic ulcers on their feet, surgical incisions with diabetics. Well, being a diabetic, I have to watch what I use. I have to be very careful. So I was skeptical of it, truthfully. So that night before I went to bed, I put some on. I said, Gary, I'm going to put this on here now. We're going to see how it is in the morning. I could not believe it. The next morning, I woke up. We looked at it. It actually had decreased in size. The redness was all but gone, and it was like a miracle. And I said, wow, I can't believe this. Put it on twice a day. The only thing that I've done is I rubbed a little bit too hard when I took it off to clean my ear, and I had a little bit of bleeding, but I put some more back on. This thing is almost healed up, and I've only used it three days. So Gary and I looked on the internet, and you can buy this Meta Honey. You can get it in jail. You can buy it off Amazon. But to get the paste that I'm using on my ear, you have to have a prescription for it. 
But any of you that have something that's hard to heal, please see your physician and get this. It's called Meta, M-E-D-I, Honey, H-O-N-E-Y, Paste. And it actually looks like honey, except it's not clear and pristine. It's got more of a cloudy appearance to it. And it does not take a lot. A little dab will do you. It's really and truly worked a miracle on my ear. And Gary will tell you that. Go ahead, Gary. You want to comment? And the great side of it is it's a natural medicine, believe it or not. It's a natural medicine. It's based on something called Manuka honey, which is a monofloral honey produced from the nectar of a Manuka tree. It's commonly sold as an alternative medicine. The honey is studied for potential antibacterial properties. They're trying to claim there's no conclusive evidence, but I think we already know that it is. That's, well, that's bullshit. <laughs> right. <laughs> Manuka honey is produced by European honeybees foraging on the Manuka tree, which grows uncultivated throughout New Zealand and southeastern Australia. So that's the only place in the world that you can get that stuff. So you can imagine that it's kind of expensive, but why are governments fighting over it? Yeah, well, the story talks about it. The debate raging in the Southern Hemisphere it all comes down to naming rights over a coveted and very expensive type of honey praised for its health benefits. Australia and New Zealand are both jockeying for shares of the Manuka honey market, which has taken off in recent years due to the growing popularity as a superfood among other things. But why are two world markets fighting over it? And then it goes on, the article talks about what it is, and then it talks about a honey growers association, which I guess has to certify that it is actually real Manuka honey. It talks about the actual source of this. How much does it cost? A 250 gram jar of Manuka honey costs around $30. My cream was very reasonable. We expected it to be really high for that 1.5 ounce tube was $23. That's not bad. Mm-hmm. Not for that wonder drug. Gary and I just couldn't believe it. Right. The what, how quickly it healed when it took everything else. We've been fighting this. I said a month and a half. I think we've been fighting this a little over two months. Mm-hmm. Really do. But it mm-hmm. really did work. It goes to show you that we have the stuff right here on earth to cure everything. It's just like they said, that we've just about wiped everything out. Mm-hmm. It's also said to treat digestive ailments, including acid reflux and fungal infections. It can also help alleviate upper respiratory issues like sinusitis, allergies, sore throats, in addition to boosting the immune system. <laughs> so, wow. Well, we need that about the uh, allergies because my nieces mm-hmm. have asthma and allergies and My sisters give them a teaspoon of locally harvested honey, and they haven't had asthma, and I couldn't tell you when. Great stuff. Yeah. That's sweet little honeybee. They just need to leave them alone. Right. Let them do their thing. Right. It's just another confirmation that everything you need to be healthy exists in nature. Sure does. Even the big companies out there who are fighting now over this, and we'll, we'll include those links in the blogcast, <laughs> they're actually fighting over this and buying each other up. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. All about honey. Okay. Cheesy's Boo, you came across also, I guess, one of our major stories here tonight about conjoined twins. You want I to- came across this story really accidentally. I was flipping through the TV I saw a documentary, and the documentary said, joined by flesh, or something along that line. And it was conjoined twins. They said that they lived the most tragic lives in modern history. And so I watched it, and I did a little research online and found out about them. They were Daisy and Violent Hilton. They were born in 1908 in Brighton, England. They were connected at the hip and buttocks, and the obstetrician believed that they would die within a month of birth. However, they lived to the age of 60, and as adults, they weighed a total of 166 pounds, and they were 4 feet 9 inches tall. These twins had been born now 
they could have been separated very easily because all that they were connected to was flesh. They shared uh, no major vessels, maybe a few little blood veins, but they each had functioning organs and they could have lived a separate life. Their mother was an unwed mother, and her name was Kate Skinner. And when she gave birth to the twins, it was during a time that people thought children that were born with birth defects were called monsters in England. I want you to think back about another man, the Elephant Man. He was put in a sideshow, and, and he was thought to be a monster himself. So this that was pretty much par for the course in England. She didn't want to keep them. Miss Skinner didn't want to keep them. And she felt like that their condition was a punishment for her actions and her sins. So she sold them. Can you believe selling your children to a woman named Mary Hilton? The twins referred to Hilton as Auntie. And it wasn't long before the woman realized she could capitalize off their disability. Meanwhile, the Skinner woman had two more children, a son named Frederick, 1910, and a daughter named Ethel Kate in 1912. Skinner died at 25, and then Ethel died during childbirth complications. So her monster children outlived her two, quote, normal children. Mary Hilton didn't see the conjoined twins as a liability. She saw them as an opportunity. And it didn't take her long to display these girls in a rear room of a British pub in her own sideshow. For the right price, a few pennies, people could examine the girls. They said one of their first memories was having people lift up their dresses to look at their connected bodies in order to see if they were actually conjoined. The girls did write in their memoirs, Our earliest and only recollection are the penetrating smell of brown ale cigars and pipes, and the movement of visitors' hands, which forever lifting our baby clothes, you just see how we were attached to each other. They also said that they were abused. Their Annie had several men in her life whom the girls called Sir, and Daisy and Violet were physically and emotionally abused and mistreated by Annie and the various Sirs they encountered over the years. Annie made sure they knew how to perform for her. Their purpose was to make her money. That's it. If the girls didn't do as she told them to, they were hit and slapped. They wrote again in their memoir, when she was displeased with us, she whipped our backs and shoulders with the buckle end of the belt. By the time the girls had turned three years old, Hilton was already taking Daisy and Violet on the road. They had a little bit of success in countries such as Germany and Austria, but Hilton wanted more, so she set her sights on the United States. No, Graham, I haven't covered it. You must have dreamed about that. You dreamed that, Graham, because I haven't covered this story. Wow, deja vu. <laughs> anyway, in 1915, when they were eight years old, they traveled to San Francisco, and they were initially denied entry because they deemed medically unfit. I don't know how they came around to say they were medically unfit. Maybe because they were conjoined, and maybe the doctors didn't know how they were going to function and all this. But anyway, that's what they did. Hilton was kind of a shrewd woman, and she got involved with the local media to help intervene on her behalf. And eventually, authorities allowed the children to enter the country. They referred to the guardians as their owners. When Annie died, her biological daughter, Edith, became the twins' guardians. She took them alongside her husband, Meyer Myers, who was the salesman from Australia. The twins referred to Edith and Meyer as their owners, who didn't let them out of their sight. They even stayed in the room with them when they were asleep at night. The Myers didn't let anyone near them for fear it would interrupt their money-making scheme. They were forced to act on vaudeville or they were threatened with being institutionalized. They traveled around a lot. They were kind of held captive by their caretakers with what, no way to escape. Daisy and Violet were forced to practice their vaudeville act 
playing the sex phone and violin for hours and hours in lieu of receiving the education. If they didn't comply, they were beaten. Myers also threatened them, insisting that if they ever tried to leave, he would send them to an institution. That's one of the quickest ways to scare anybody is that, especially in that day and time. The twins also worked in burlesque, and I didn't go into too much detail about what they did in the burlesque, but I can imagine it was probably for somebody who had a fetish. They started making a big impact on audiences in the 1920s when they were teenagers. They appeared alongside vaudeville icons such as Charlie Chaplin and Bob Hope. They were also successful at one point. They were earning up to $5,000 a week. Theirs was such an unusual act that they were very popular among the audiences. However, the Myers took all the money and never let the girl have any. It's ironic that one person helped change their lives, and that was Harry Houdini. You know, he was the illusionist and the magician. He took a great interest in these girls and advised them to learn more about their situation in order to help themselves. Not realizing how famous they were, the twins read newspapers and other medias and were shocked. Eventually, they came in contact with an attorney, Martin Arnold, who was assisting them in a different suit. Arnold was surprised to hear that the girls, 21 at the time, were not independent of the Myers yet. So at their request, he helped liberate them. Daisy and Violet were granted emancipation in 1931, and awarded around $80,000. The emancipation was great on one part, and then on another part, it opened up a whole different ball game. A lot of people, of course, took advantage of them, and the world opened up to them. That included romance. One of the problems was they didn't know anything about sex. And, of course, nature takes its course, and it can be learned. However, if one sister took a lover to bed, the other sister was right by her side. How'd they handle that? Well, Violet said, why well, just turned over and read a book or ate an apple? Each of the sisters was married at one point, but both at different times. Violet applied for license to marry by a musician, but she was denied in 21 states because it was considered immoral and indecent for them to marry. However, she and Daisy both eventually got married. Through the marriage, didn't last long. It's really unclear if these marriages were actual relationships or just uh, stunts. Here's something else that I, I thought was very fascinating because I saw this movie. It's called Freaks, and it was 1932. And uh, let's see, I'm trying to think. Todd Browning's made this movie in 1932. Which And that boosted their fame for a while. In 1942, they published their autobiography, The Lives and Loves of the Hilton Sisters. Daisy described their circumstances as, We were lonely rich girls who were really paupers living in practical slavery. She later added, I'm not a machine. I'm a woman. I should have the right to live like one. In the later years of their life, they struggled to make a living. They appeared in a film about their lives in 1951 called Chained for Life and then opened a hot dog stand a few years later. However, other vendors were upset that the freak were taking business away from them. By 1961, they lost their appeal and their tour manager quit. They were destitute. They wound up working as cashiers in a grocery store, and the store owner redesigned one of the counters so they could work together. In spare time, they performed for their co-workers. This is a very sad part to me. Defying medical odds, the sisters led a long life until they didn't show up to work in 1969. The authorities were called to their home. Medical tests revealed that the twins had died of the flu, Unfortunately, Daisy died first, and Violet passed away several days later. Experts believe she may have been too ill to call for help. They were 60 years old, and they were buried together. I thought this was one of the saddest stories that I had ever read.
please, if you can see the documentary, you'll find it online. And I would advise everybody to please watch it. You see so many now where conjoined twins are separated and they're able to go on and live lives. And those that aren't live happily ever after. I think maybe, Grimnir, I was talking about the conjoined twin brothers that live up here in North Carolina. They worked in a sideshow. I think that might be what you're thinking about. We did talk about Ronnie and Donnie. I think we talked about them, too. But that's all I've got. Okay. Yeah, I was looking back through and actually watching the Doppler radar, too, and it's not looking very good. But anyway, of course, we may have to pop out here quickly, but I'll try to cover as much as I can. But yeah, I think also there were some similarities to the Bouvier family story as well that might have... Yeah, uh, that might have been it, the Bouvier story, yeah. Yeah, and so... I don't know. So let's just see what we can fly through with here. I hate to run too quickly through it, but let's see what we can do. One of the big things that jumped up on my radar screen was some allegation, or at least some suggestion, that there's evidence that the Hawaiian volcanic eruption that we're seeing right now in the news, and people there are, are unfortunately experiencing, having been caused by the Puna ge- geothermal venture. Because they say that because the fact that the activity is concentrated in the area surrounding the Puna geothermal venture, which, as many people probably don't know, that is a geothermal electrical producing operation there that provides electricity to about 30,000 homes. It's kind of interesting, a little bit perhaps, I don't know, I can't decide whether this is a little bit alarmist or maybe they're on to something. Because as I dig through, I find that this whole geofracking, as it's called, isn't really fracking in the sense of what we call fracking. It's fracking as when you inject fluid into, you know, fracturing bedrock and so forth. The geothermal activity, by their own description, is that they find the pre-existing cracks and drill into them in order to create a closed system where they can take advantage of the geothermal activity, the hot water in other words. So yes and no. Where do you draw the line? They acknowledge the fact that they drill into the cracks. Okay. And this has been looked at for quite a while. It's been talked about for quite a while. It's not a new thing. And an article of fracking in Hawaii They talk about the fact that although fracking is a technique used most often for extraction of natural gas, it is also used in geothermal energy extraction. And there are differing opinions as to whether the Puna geothermal venture plant in Puna is actually fracking. The Hawaiian Electric Light Company, or HELCO, solicited proposals to increase the geothermal output in Hawaii County from 38 megawatts to 88 megawatts, so forth and so on. And the questions posed is the geothermal fracking. Now, they're using that word technically a little bit misleading, but I can see functionally where there are some similarities. They talk about there have been at least three studies released in 2013 confirming the correlation between fracking and induced earthquakes and include the links for those studies. So that's kind of a question, and it's also addressed again actually back in 2013 through a real estate publication called hawaiilife.com. I know let's go ahead and just kind of read through this. this last, the writer says, Last week I joined a rare educational tour for the Big Island Realtors at the Puna Geothermal Venture in Pahoa, Hawaii, to learn about geothermal energy on the Big Island. And is it clean or a nuisance? And goes on to describe what geothermal energy is about. But one big statement here. The reason for the location of the Puna Geothermal Venture Plant in a rural residential area is because that area is ripe with existing fractures into which drilling can be done. PVG does not employ the use of hydro fracturing, commonly known as fracking, to create fissures. They only explore existing naturally occurring fissures into the Earth's crust. Then they drill into the crust to reach magma-generated heat and steam. Interesting. 
So you can use your own common sense and your discernment here to form an opinion, I guess, as to whether or not the drilling into a pressurized system might contribute to an eruptive event. And I can also see where the liability aspects of all this is pretty significant. Because I think a lot of folks are out of their homes there. Anyway, I think we're going to cut it off short, Gigi's Boo. I'm looking at the Doppler, okay. and we're about to get... About to get hit. Yeah, as much as I've used countermeasures to try to break it up a little bit. Uh, <laughs> some of you know what I mean. It looks like it's about to zero in. It's a pretty heavy system. Anyhow, thanks so much for joining us here tonight. And sorry we had to cut it off. That's right. Y'all remember, I love you all big to my heart. And be sure to take that road less traveled. That's, Good night, everybody. That's right, Gigi's Boo, and thanks for that. And thanks for listening. Check out reallibertymedia.com as you can. RLM Radio, and also give a thought to maybe throwing a little support that way. Grimner appreciates it. Anyway, take care. We'll catch you next week on the road less traveled.